Paige, appreciate that so much. You know, the devil is constantly trying to speed us up. He is, he is constantly trying to crowd our minds and our life with not necessarily bad things many times. Uh, your, your mind and your life can be crowded with good things, doing good, being here, being there, all these different things. The Bible says a divided mind is unstable. And if we can just stop for a moment, if we can be still, God said, be still and know that I am God. A lot of times you can't see God working and you can't see what God is doing until you're still enough. And sometimes it takes being on the other side of something even to be able to look back and say, okay, I see what was happening there as Paige just described over the last few years of her life. and um, You just don't know. You, let me just encourage you to do this. When you don't know what's going on, and you don't know what to do, and you don't see what God is doing, give him the benefit of the doubt that he's working. Because <laughs> he is. He is working behind the scenes. He knows what he's doing, and he is going to work his best for you. He, he loves his children. And so you may be going through something today, and you're like, what is going on? Why am I facing this? What am I dealing with this for? I can't, God, I can't see what you're doing. Be still. Be still. Trust God. He's working. He knows what he's doing. Take your Bibles, if you would, this morning. Acts chapter 21. Didn't the choir do a good job on their song this morning? I'll tell you what, that's one of my favorite songs anyway. Um, and uh, sinners saved by grace. That's what we are. Uh, we're saints, of course, but uh, we've been saved by grace. And so I appreciate the, uh, the song, the song choice, how it was delivered, the passion behind it as well. While you're turning there to Acts 21, let me just, I was going to read this to you a while ago, and I, forgot, I left it over there, and I was looking through my notes, and anyway, I didn't have it up here, so that's why I didn't mention what the the topics for each Sunday school class with I'm going to just go through them very quickly just to kind of get you to be thinking. You might not have gotten one of these on the way in this morning, so I wanted to put this before you. One of the classes that's going to be taught uh, by Brother Bob is on Bible doctrines. And um, as Christians, we need to know Bible doctrine. We need to know what we believe. And so you're going to hear doctrines about the Bible, God, Christ, the Holy Spirit, man, salvation, the church, angels, the end of days, all of those things are going to be discussed. That's a lot in eight weeks, uh, but, uh, and some deep stuff. Uh, but uh, Brother Bob is, is a great teacher, and he's going to do a good job laying it out in an understandable way, help us to, to grasp each of these things. So that's one class. The, the other cla another class is spiritual warfare. Brother Johnny is going to be speaking uh, about that. Uh, these are the topics. If we're to defeat the devil, we must know our enemy. We must know the weapons he uses, and we must know what we must do in order to prepare for victory. We are in a battle every single day with the devil. He is the enemy. He wants to devour us. He wants to destroy us. We need to know how to fight against him. That's going to be an excellent, excellent class. And then Brother Tyler is going to be speaking on anger, taming a powerful emotion. He's going to be using a, a really, really good book. If, you have a, if you're part of this class, you'll, you'll receive one of these. Um, it's by Gary Chapman, and uh, uh, he, Brother Tyler, I had never read it. He gave me a copy of it several weeks ago, and so I've been kind of going through that and uh, just some good insights about anger. Where does anger come from? How to deal with anger? By the way, anger is an emotion that God gives us for good. You realize that? Uh, be angry and sin not. Uh, and, and so we're going to learn how to do that in that class, how to um, use a anger for the right reasons, and then how to help other folks uh, dealing with anger as well. And then I'll be teaching a class about, um, I, I just entitled it, A Handbook for Church Members. Uh, whether you've been a church member for a month or 50 years, uh, you could benefit from this class. We're going to talk about what is the purpose of our church, what do we believe, what is a free will Baptist. There's a lot of free will Baptists today that have been in free will Baptist churches all their life, and they don't know what free will Baptists believe. What sets us apart from other Baptists? What makes us different? What are our distinctives? We're going to be talking about all of that, uh, where we came from. going to be looking at some history as well. What are the first steps of becoming a member? What's a good church member? And how can you use your gifts to serve? All of those things will be dealt with in that class. Good classes, right? 
Sound good? Piqued your interest a little bit? Maybe just a little bit? Go sign up after the service today, all right? I hope there's a line all the way down the hall signing up for those classes uh, today. Uh, we need to know probably uh, by the middle of August, second week of August, uh, who's going to be in what class so we'll know how to prepare. But anyway, be praying about it, and uh, you sign up according to what God would have you to do. Acts chapter 21, we're going to start reading in verse uh, 15. So if you would, follow along with me. Acts chapter 21, verse 15. And after those days, we took up our carriages and went up to Jerusalem. All right, now Luke is writing this account. He is the one who wrote these words down for us from the book of Acts. But he is describing the party of Paul, all right? Paul's group, they're headed to Jerusalem. And he says they're going up to Jerusalem, verse 16. There went with us also certain of the disciples of Caesarea and brought them with one nation of Cyprus, an old disciple with whom we should lodge. And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. Now, this comes right after uh, what we looked at last week in verse 14, the will of the Lord be done. You remember that message from last week? And uh, folks were trying to get Paul not to go to Jerusalem. There was going to be danger waiting there, persecution, maybe perhaps even death. And, of course, Paul said, no, I, bl I believe I need to go. I believe the Lord's leading me there. And so they, they said, okay, we give up. <laughs> we're not going to fight. Uh, Paul, we might disagree with you, but we're not disagreeing with God. The will of the Lord be done. And so now they are, they are heading in that direction. Now, let me just say this, just to kind of lead us into what we're going to be talking about today. Every once in a while, when you're reading the Bible, especially when you're reading the King James Version, you'll come across a word or a phrase that, that causes you to say, that just doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, I don't know what that's talking about. I don't understand that. And most of the time, it's a word or a phrase that was used in a particular way during the time it was written that we don't use it that way today. It's kind of like if a person uh, came from another country and, and they come into America and they were trying to learn the English language and decided not to, to learn it until they got here. It would really depend on what section of the country of how they would pick up certain words. Uh, I found out very quickly when we moved out to uh, Illinois many years ago, um, uh, I, didn't, I couldn't call like a Coke or a Pepsi drinks anymore. Uh, they didn't, I don't know, what do you talk, they, everybody called them pop there. I taught a seventh grade class while I was there and, and all my kids, hey, 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 teacher, can I go get a pop? Or, and, and then some certain, if you go down to Missouri, they call them sodies. All right, sody pop, sody, sody pop. And, and then I noticed when we moved to Pennsylvania, you, you didn't dare ask or, or, you know, you had to be careful how you responded if someone said, would you like a drink? Uh, because that there meant an alcoholic beverage most of the time, all right? In North Carolina, we say, would you like a drink? Well, which kind? Is it Coke or is it Pepsi or is it Mountain Dew? Whatever it is, right? So it depends on what section of the country. And then we use different colloquialisms, I mean, different phrases, different uh, ways of saying things. We have a very different way of saying things in the South. We got a kind of a slang saying for everything, you know. Well, that doesn't amount to a hill of beans. If you were coming from another country, you'd be looking for a pile of, of, of beans somewhere, right? I mean, it just wouldn't make any sense to you. And that is the case sometimes when you come across certain things in the Bible. I came across some things that some famous people have said uh, famous Americans have said over the years that just didn't quite make sense, even in how they said those. You remember the actress Brooke Shields from years ago? She said, smoking kills. If you're killed, you've lost a very important part of your life. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm not sure exactly what she was talking about there. I, I, um, she should have stopped at the beginning, I guess. Marion Barry, you remember that name, former mayor of uh, Washington, D.C.? Uh, he, I hope he wasn't in charge of tourism. But anyway, he said, outside of the killings, Washington has one of the lowest crime rates in the country. <laughs> I mean, sign me up, right? I would love to move there uh, for that. Danny Ozark, former manager of the Philadelphia Phillies, said about baseball, half this is 90% mental. <laughs> Maybe he's using a different kind of math there. I don't know. Maybe it's the, I don't know. Joe Theismann, former NFL football quarterback, said, the word genius isn't applicable in football. 
A genius is a guy like Norman Einstein. Norman Einstein. I don't, I don't know where he got that name from. But anyway, Vladi Divac, NBA basketball player, said, we all get heavier as we get older because there's a lot more information in our heads. <laughs> now, I'm glad he said that because I've been wondering. I, I have. I've been wondering where that's coming from. But anyway, this came from the Department of Social Services in Greenville, South Carolina. They sent out this following letter, actual letter. Your food stamps will be stopped effective this particular date because we received notice that you passed away. May God bless you. You may reapply if there is a change in your circumstances. <laughs> now, that's just ridiculous, isn't it? And then this is probably my favorite. Miss Alabama, <laughs> and you can, you can hear some really good answers at some of these pageants, but... It, if you, uh, you probably don't watch him, you're like me. But anyway, Miss Alabama, 1994, she was asked this question. If you could live forever, would you and why? Her answer, I would not live forever because we should not live forever. Because if we were supposed to live forever, then we would live forever. But we cannot live forever, which is why I would not live forever. <laughs> huh? <laughs> you know, what did she just say? You know, there are, there are places in the Bible. Have you ever had this reaction when you have read something in the Bible? You've read a verse. You've read a passage of Scripture. And you went, what, what did they just say? I, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't fully understand what that's talking about. Well, when you come to verse 15 of Acts 21, this is one of those passages for me. When I came to this verse, I said, what, what was just said there? What is he talking about? Notice again. And after those days, we took up our carriages and went up to Jerusalem. Now, what picture does that create in your mind? Does it create the picture maybe that this is how they got their ride to Caesarea to Jerusalem? They had a fancy carriage. It was pulled by six white horses. Is, is that what comes to your mind? Maybe perhaps it comes to your mind that that, that their carriage was broken. And so they first had to pick it up and set it up on its wheels. I mean, they, he did say take up their carriages. But here is one of those times that what was used then, this word, is not the way that we use it today. It has nothing to do with it. To help us understand what this word means, I want you to think of two other words. I want you to think of the word baggage and the word luggage. All right? Now, what do those two words have in common? Well, first of all, somebody might say, well, they're synonyms. They kind of mean the same thing. Baggage and luggage, you know, that's something that, you know, they're containers. You put your clothes in. You're doing some traveling. You know, you're away from home. You use baggage and luggage. So they're synonyms. Maybe some other things that might come to your mind is they're seven letters. Both of them have seven letters. They both end with the same three letters, A-G-E. Those are just three of the things. Now, let's take baggage and luggage, and now let's throw the word in from this passage in verse 15, carriage. Well, once again, what do all three of those have in common? Again, somebody might say they end with A-G-E, all right? But they're also synonyms in a way. Originally, each of those three words did not have anything to do with the container. Did you know that? In other words, we say, I've got my luggage. Most of the time, we think of a suitcase, right? I've got my luggage. But the words originally meant what was inside the container. So baggage was the stuff that we threw into the bag to carry somewhere. Luggage was the stuff that we lugged around in the airport or in hotels. And carriage was the stuff that it was a little lighter than the other stuff, and so we just kind of carried it with us. In the dictionary, Webster's Dictionary, the very first definition of carriage is what we normally would think about. A wheeled vehicle, especially a four-wheeled horse-drawn passenger vehicle, often of an elegant design. That would not make any sense in this passage of Scripture. You have to go down to definition number six in the dictionary. This is what it says. The act or process of transporting or carrying something, and that is the definition of this word. There was something that they picked up that they needed to transport, that they needed to carry with them to Jerusalem. They picked it up. They carried the stuff. Now, 
I'm going to do something this morning that I hardly ever do when I preach a message. I'm going to, here's, here's an English word, all right? I'm going to allegorize this passage of Scripture. And you've got to be very careful when you do that with God's Word because, I look, I've heard some messages that have got some preachers in trouble uh, for doing it that way. But I think there are some applications that we can make this morning using this passage of Scripture that will help us. I'm going to give you three truth statements using this passage. Now, keep that in mind. Paul and his companions had to pick up their carriage. They had to pick up some baggage and take it with them. Now, let let me give you the three truth applications. First of all, truth number one, all of us have baggage to carry. Every single one of us here this morning have some kind of baggage to carry. I was talking to a friend some years ago, and this is what he said to me. He said, I have such a passion, such a heart to help young men who had absentee fathers. He said, I want to do that. I'm trying to figure out a way in order to help young men through that. He said, the reason is because I went through that. When I was a kid, my dad wasn't around. And so I know what they're going through. I know the feelings that they're having. And so his heart was reaching out and helping others like him. Now, I found that very interesting. It was commendable that he wanted to help young men uh, go through that. But it also brought my attention to this fact. He was an adult. He was married. He had children. He was in the ministry. But yet, he was still carrying the baggage from his childhood. Many people go through their adult life carrying baggage from their childhood. Things like abuse from their parents. The lack of acceptance from their peers. The loneliness and neglect. Or even the awful scarring of molestation. They, they carry that with them for all of their life. Some people carry baggage with them from their adulthood. It might be the verbal or uh, a physical abuse from a spouse. It might be the loss of a spouse through death or maybe through abandonment. It might be the ugliness of divorce. It might be the hurt of a wayward child. It might be the hurt from the death of a child that they just, They carry with them all the way through life. It might be through rejection of some kind, even rejection from their own family. They're dealing with that as they go through life or friends or society. Some carry physical baggage. Some carry mental baggage, emotional baggage, even spiritual baggage. Now, whether or not I mention yours specifically this morning, the point is we all have some. Every one of us walk around with it all the time. Now, Sometimes the baggage is the kind that you can hide. People don't know you're carrying it. You can seal it so well. You cover it up. People don't know. But sometimes that baggage is out there for everybody to see. But listen to me this morning. There is some baggage that that people are carrying around that God never intended for us to carry. We're lugging things around with us that God says lay down. that, That God said is taken care of. You say, what kind of baggage are you talking about? Well, the unnecessary baggage could be the sins of your past. Now, think about this. Here's a person who comes to Jesus. They ask Jesus to forgive them of their sins. They've heard the verses. They've heard the promise. Romans chapter 10, which says, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the mouth confession is made Uh, unto salvation they hear that they hear that promise they hear the promise of romans 10 13 for whosoever shall call upon the name of the lord shall be saved and so that's what they do that's what many of you have done hopefully all of us have done you came to that point in time in your life that you believed jesus was the only way and you trusted in jesus and you said jesus if you will have me i'm yours Jesus, if you'll please forgive me of those sins. And you know what Jesus did when you ask him? He kept his promise because he always keeps his promise. He saved you from your sins. He washed those sins away by his blood. And the Bible says that you have been forgiven. I love that picture from Pilgrim's Progress where Pilgrim gets up there at the foot of the cross and he receives Christ as his Savior and that burden of sin rolls off his back down that hill. What a picture of what happens to our sin when we come to Christ. That sin is taken away. The Bible says it's been buried in the deepest sea and God remembers them no more. 
Now, that doesn't mean that God suddenly gets amnesia. We know that God knows everything, right? It means that God does not hold us accountable for that sin. In other words, the slate has been wiped clean. Our name is written in the Lamb's book, and there's not a list of offenses under it. God takes care of those things for us. But here's the problem. God doesn't remember those sins anymore, but we have a hard time forgetting those sins. We, and I understand that, especially if it's wrongdoing, especially if it's something that you know just, just weighs on us. And it, what happens if we're not careful... Those sins that have come off of our back, we're not to carry those sins anymore. God's taking care of those things. The devil will come slinking around, and he'll start piling those things back on. I remember watching a movie some years ago, and, and these two girls were taken. Uh, there was a lady that their dad was interested in, and they were taking her on a hike up a hill. And all along the journey up the hill... Every time she would stop to get some drink of water, she'd lay her pack down. They'd put rocks in her pack. And the further she got up that hill, the heavier that pack was. And man, she was done with it. You know what? The devil will do the same thing to you. He'll come around and he'll say, let me put another rock in there. Let me put another sin in there. Let me put another one. And if you're not careful and you allow him to do that, I'm telling you, you'll get tired. You'll get defeated. You'll want to give up. You'll, get, you'll, you'll, you'll start thinking, you know what? I'm not qualified to live this victorious Christian life. God can't use me. Look at me. I'm just struggling through life because I've got this baggage on my back. I can barely put a foot in front of the other. It's so heavy. Is the Christian life supposed to be like this? Hey, when the devil comes around to pile some more guilt from your past on you, tell him to get lost. Tell him that you aren't one of his children anymore, that you are a child of the king, and that God, if he's not going to remember him, you're not going to carry him around with you either. Oh, look, all of us have baggage to carry, but don't carry around unnecessary baggage. Don't carry around the baggage that God has already relieved you of, taking care of those things from you. Number two, truth number two, we all have baggage. Number two, we can have help to carry our baggage. One of the great blessings of the Christian life is the fact that we're not the only ones living it. That we have been saved, we're on the road to heaven, we're going to get there one of these days, but on that road there's some other people with us. There's some brothers and sisters in Christ that are also traveling that same road. And what I'm about to tell you is something that's very hard for me to do. And I promise you, it's probably hard for many of you to do. And that is because we want to be strong. We want to be self-sufficient. We don't want to admit that we can't handle things on our own. We don't want to ask for help. We want, we want to take care of it on our own. But listen to me. We need to learn to ask for help. We need to learn to selectively share our baggage with mature saints of God. Now, that doesn't mean you go around sharing all, everything's going on in your life with anybody and everybody. Some people can't handle it. So, some people just cannot handle you sharing. But we need to find some folks that we can give some baggage to. In other words, can you help me with this? Can you hear me out on this? I've had church members over the years, I've had some good Christian friends that have come to me with enormous weights. And they just wanted somebody to know. They just wanted to tell somebody. And look, there are some things that people have told me over the years that I've never told anybody. I couldn't. They told me not to. Now, there's sometimes folks will say, now, you, you can share this with your wife. And I cannot tell you how relieving that is. To know that I'm not the only one helping with this baggage that I can share with her. And it is a relieving feeling. But there are some things that I'll take to my grave because they told me not to tell. And I want you to know this this morning. My door is always open to you. My door is always open. And if you just want me to sit there and listen, I'll do that. 
If you want me to pray in any way, I'll do it. But I want you to know this. I know what keeping things in confidence really is. Some people don't know what that is. Some people don't know what it is. I know what that means. And if there's ever a time you say, you know what? Will you just, would you just be my sounding board? Can I just come to your office and yell at you for a while? <laughs> would that be all right? Yeah, that's fine. And I want you to know, it, it goes no further. Because I understand the benefit of that. Because I've got some folks in my life that I can do that with. I've got some folks that I can talk to and I can say, look, I wouldn't tell another soul this. This is what, what I'm thinking. This is what I'm going through. And there's something about that, and I hope that's happened for every person that's ever shared things with me. There's something about that that helps you come up a little bit. Just to know that somebody cares enough to listen. But more importantly than me, and more importantly than having good Christian friends and people that you trust, there is one that I'm telling you, he is happy to help carry your baggage. I want to show you who that is. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. This ought to be one of your go-to passages when you're facing stuff. 1 Peter chapter 5. Look, look down in verse 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. It's at the back of your Bible. And verse 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourself unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another. Be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. I, I see what we're talking about in that verse. It takes a little humility to go to another person and say, I'm weak in this area. I'm struggling in this area. I, I don't have answers in this area. Notice verse 6, humble yourselves. Therefore, under the mighty hand of God, and he may exalt you in due time. I love verse 7. Casting all your care Upon him. Who is him? Jesus. Why? For he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. You better learn to share it. You better learn to run to Jesus. Why? Because if you don't, the devil will destroy you through that. It'll eat you up. It's always been the business of the Lord to help us with the burdens that we have. Scripture says, Who his own self bear our sins and his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live under righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. So now that we're saved, we're children of God by faith in Christ, the Lord continues to help us with our back. He wants to help. He waits to help. But he's also waiting for you to ask waiting for you to humble yourself and say, Lord, I need you in this. So number one, we all carry baggage. Would you agree to that? Number two, there's some help, but we've got to ask for it. Number three, we should be willing to help others carry their baggage. Now look, I know I'm not the only one that, that goes through this. I got problems, all right? I deal with stuff. I have those days. You ever had those days? If one more thing, if one more thing happens, I'm going to lose it. I'm going to lose it. I'm, I'm, I'm at the edge. I'm, I'm at the jumping off point. And then somebody comes, or somebody calls, and they got problems. And they want me to listen to their problems. And they don't even ask if I want to listen. They begin to tell me their problems. And my flesh says, throws up the stop sign. I don't have time for this. I got my own problems. I'm dealing with me right now. I can't deal with you right now. I can't deal with your problem. And I, my flesh, will shut them out. Now look, I understand we all get there. We all have those days. But that shouldn't be a habit in us. That shouldn't be an all-the-time thing where we turn a blind eye to everybody who comes along carrying baggage. We act like we don't see. 
We act like we don't hear. I don't have to. It, 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 by the way, it costs you something every time you stop to help somebody. Sometimes it's an inconvenience. Sometimes it costs you time. It costs you energy. Definitely costs you energy. It could cost you money. Whatever. But it's an investment. I want to show you a passage of Scripture from Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Because when we get to that point where we say, you know what, I don't have time to help another person with their baggage. I got, t I got stuff of, of my own. We need to come to this passage right here. Philippians chapter 2. And let's start reading in verse 1. Philippians chapter 2, and verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ. Now, before I read any further, we know that these, the, the main emphasis of this verse is centered around salvation. We get that, okay? When you read down through there, you know he's talking about salvation. But I think Paul is trying to teach us something further here as we continue to read. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded. Circle that word in your mind, like-minded. Having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own thing, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. What is Paul teaching us here? He is saying something very simple. Be Christ-like. Follow Christ's example. Let this mind, who's mine? Jesus is mine. How did he think? What did he do? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Paul writes in Galatians chapter 6, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, Ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think of himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Those verses kind of sound confusing a little bit. He says, bear your own burden. And he says, bear one another's burden. You know what those two passages that we just read tell us? What did Jesus do when he came to this? Did he have problems? Sure, all the time. He, look, he was in all points tempted like you and me. I mean, he faced all kinds of temptation. Not only that, everywhere he went, he had problems to deal with. He was surrounded by multitudes of people. He couldn't get away from the crowd. The only time he could get away was, hey, fellas, I'm going up there on the mountain, <laughs> and I'm, I'm going to get along with the Father, and I'm going to pray with him a while. You know, you, you do your own thing for a while. Leave me alone for a while. I've got to do this. He had to take specific timeouts in order to do that. He had problems that he dealt with, but what was Jesus constantly doing? Reaching out, helping, giving of himself. Paul said, let that mind be in you. He said, Paul said, while you're having your own problems, bearing your own issues, your own baggage, at the same time, try to help somebody else. Now, that doesn't mean I can help everybody. I can't do that. I'll burn out very, very quickly if I try to help everybody. And I, I have found over the years that I have a tendency to feel what people feel. And I don't know if that's a pastoral thing or I don't know if that's a, a Christian thing. I, I don't know what that is. But when I know somebody's going, when they're crying, I, I'm crying usually. When they're hurting, I'm hurting with them. 
And it's hard for me sometimes to separate myself from that. So I can't help everybody at the same time. But I need to make sure I'm helping somebody all the time. I'm helping, yeah, I'm bearing my burdens, my, my carriage, my baggage, but I'm helping somebody else carry their baggage too. One of the things that has helped me over the years more than anything is this. When somebody else is going through something, somebody else maybe has done something they shouldn't have done, and they're in this predicament, what am I going to do now? It could be horribly bad. Something that's helped me is this. Not to judge them. Not to put them down. Not, not to say, I could see that coming. You know, it, they deserve that, all those things. But to say to myself, if it wasn't for the grace of God, that'd be me. That would be me right there. I would be in that same, look, I've had friends over the years that have fallen in the ministry and they're no longer in the ministry. And the first, I promise you, the first thing in my mind was not, well, I could see that coming. The first thing came into my mind, if it wasn't for the grace of God, it'd be me. That'd be me. When you can put yourself in that position, because you will be there sooner or later, you will be in a position that you need help. You will be in a position that you need somebody, a brother and sister, to come alongside of you of that road that you're walking on together and say, I'm here for you. I'm praying for you. I want to encourage you. You can lean on me. You're going to need that. So that helps you when you know that somebody is dealing with something. What if it were me? What would I want somebody to do? So what's the message all about? Here it is, very simple. It's the points of the message. We all carry baggage. <laughs> we're all in this together. <laughs> we're all dealing with something. Two, we can have help. But we've got to ask for it. That's asking one another for help. That's asking our Heavenly Father for help. And then number three, we ought to be looking for others that we can help with their baggage as well. Let's take up our carriages. As Paul told his companions to do in a physical sense, let's do that in a real sense every day as we go forward. Would you stand to your feet?